Well, this topic this morning is, in some ways, a slightly delicate one, because um, if you're like me, you would probably, in your spiritual journey, have had all kinds of uh, ways of accounting for the difference between what science apparently tells us about our origins and what the Bible does. And uh, I, for one, spent some 20 years believing, um, I now realise, contrary to what the Bible says. And then the lights went on, um, thanks to the grace of God, and it made an enormous difference to me to understand that I can trust God's word right from the beginning and I don't have to do any uh, tap dancing or gymnastics around the opening chapters, that I can accept them just as God has said them or written them. In fact, one of the things I haven't said much about, but we've talked about the authority of the Bible and that it is trustworthy and true, but also it was written to be understood. The purpose of God giving us his written word was so that we could receive the revelation. So it's not written in codes. It's not written in ways that only a select few can understand. And you look back through the history of the church and there have been times when uh, various people have tried to set themselves up as the interpreters and authorities uh, on the Bible. And once it was all in Latin and the people couldn't even read it and only the church taught it and no one really knew what the Bible said until some very courageous people, you know, the story translated the Bible uh, into common language. It was printed. In the 1500s, this revolution occurred and people started to read the Word of God for the first time. And what an extraordinary change that brought. But I want to talk about ways in which people have tried to integrate what they have genuinely believed to be the scientific proof of the age of the earth and the universe into what the Bible says. Now, I think it's led to a lot of confusion and it's certainly led to confusion in my life. And so what I'm really sharing today is going to be more, I guess, um, the impact it's had on me at a personal level. Now, it's interesting that um, right at the very beginning, the enemy comes into the garden and the first reported words of Satan are these. Did God really say? Isn't it interesting how the enemy first casts doubt? So he said, you must not... Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So first of all, he questions it, and then he grossly overstates what God had actually said. What did God say to Adam and Eve? You can eat from any tree in the garden except that. Right, so there was only one that they must not eat from. What did the enemy say? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I mean, that's ridiculous. That's not what God said at all. He said only one out of all of them. So he's grossly misrepresented what God has said and he's cast doubt. And then the next thing he says is an outright lie. So he begins with doubt and then he moves to a lie. And, you know, his tactics aren't any different today from way back then at the beginning. So did God really say that he created the world in six days? Did God really say that the creation was very good? Did God really say that death and suffering came as a result of Adam's sin? So we need to think about those things. Well, there have been all kinds of ways, I call them compromise theories, where we've attempted to to blend the evolutionary worldview of our culture into what the Bible says. And Bible colleges in our country teach pretty much every one of those at some stage or other, and sadly, um, mostly the major ones. But these theories actually blur and fog up the clear gospel message. It obscures the light of the gospel. Now, some people have taught these things wrongly simply because they have been taught wrongly and they genuinely believe this is correct. Others, however, do know better. 
And uh, I think I'm just aware of the fact that the Holy Spirit always leads us into truth. So if we follow where the Holy Spirit is leading, we will come to the truth. We can trust him in that. So isn't creation a barrier to faith? Now, this is something that's a well-meaning kind of concern. People think, gosh, you know, we've got a hard job persuading people to believe what the Bible says without having to confront this whole issue of, you know, the evolutionary story, which surely has got all the scientific backing. Um, how can you possibly stand against that and still remain credible in our society? So no one wants to put these barriers in the way of people coming to faith. But I often point out, you know, nobody believes or there's no scientific support for a virgin conceiving, nor is there scientific support for a person who's been dead for three days rising from the dead. So Christians are already pretty daft in the eyes of the world, right? Because those things are things that we as Christians believe. Why? Because the Bible tells us. So thinking that God created the world is, I guess, if you like, in one sense, just another bizarre thing that Christians believe in the eyes of the world. But the point here is that science is not the arbiter of truth. Science does not determine truth. Science can do observations in the present and can make deductions and can discover how the world works, but science cannot reveal absolute truth. If you hear expressions like, oh, the science is settled, you know that is not science, that's actually propaganda. Science is never settled. It's always open to the possibility of a new discovery. Take, for instance, Newton's laws of motion. They were fantastic in predicting the positions of the planets. And, and then some tiny anomalies were observed and people couldn't reconcile the observations they were making and Newtonian mechanics. And about 100 years ago, Einstein came up with the general relativity theory and all of a sudden, they could solve the problem precisely. Now, it's not that Newton was wrong. Newton was simply incomplete. And Einstein is an extension of that. He's gone further. So science always approaches truth uncertainly but can never reveal absolute truth. But it can reveal absolute error. So I could say to you, um, I believe water boils at 110 degrees centigrade at one atmosphere pressure. And you could say, well, I don't think you're right, Mark. Let's do an experiment. So you measure the temperature at which water boils at one atmosphere pressure, you get 100 degrees centigrade. So you were wrong. So science can reveal absolute truth, but it cannot reveal, sorry, Science can reveal absolute error, but it cannot reveal absolute truth. Important. So science is not the arbiter of truth. Antagonists like Richard Dawkins actually ridicule Christians who kind of select bits of the Bible to believe, but not other bits. And that's what I did for some 20 years. I believed in the resurrection. I believed in the virginal conception but I didn't believe the Genesis stuff. I was cherry picking, I believe this bit, but I don't believe that bit. And uh, in an interview, Dawkins said this, it seems to me an odd proposition that we should adhere to some parts of the Bible story, but not to others. After all, when it comes to important moral questions, by what standards do we cherry pick the Bible? Why bother with the Bible at all if we have the ability to pick and choose from it what is right and what is wrong? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? So some people will say, well, you know, that bit's right, but not that bit. And someone else will have a different opinion. And so what's your reference point? There is none, is there? I think it's been a great tragedy that the church by and large has accepted the secular view of our origins. The scientist has come along and said, look, here's the proof of millions of years. And the theologian says, oh, dear, I'll just have to add it into the Bible somehow. But in fact, as I think, I hope you've picked up in the course of this weekend, you don't have to do that. The Bible, in fact, is the source of truth. So these are some of the compromise theories that people have come up with over the years. And I want to just touch on them uh, quickly because you will come across them from time to time or you may hold to one or other of these views as I did. And I want to start looking first at theistic evolution. This is the idea that God used evolution to create. 
and that was my kind of default position. I grew up in uh, a Christian family, became a Christian when I was 10, and I studied science, I loved science, and so I naturally tried to integrate the two together. But to understand what theistic evolution really is about, I want to just talk about what the gospel is. And because I'm an engineer, I do this in a structural way, so you don't have to forgive me for that. So right at the beginning, we have God creating a perfect world. And he sees what he's made and he declares it to be very good. So God and man have a perfect relationship. There's no disease, no suffering, no death. Perfect world. But then Adam rebels against God. And the Bible says, for since death came through a man, for as in Adam all die, right? The New Testament's very clear that the origin of death and suffering is our sin, not God's creation. And that brought separation from God. Disease, suffering and death now enter the world. So mankind is in a hopeless mess. So God, out of his astonishing love for us, comes in human form in the person of Jesus, and he pays the price. And the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So Jesus pays the price for our sin, which is death, by giving his life for us on the cross. But it doesn't end there, does it? Because we read that he rose from the dead. Jesus conquered death, which proves he's the son of God. And that gives us, every single one of us, a hope for the future. The Bible says, if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. So the resurrection is an essential part of the whole gospel message. Now, if that's all there is, then I'll qualify those words in a minute. Nothing happens until a sinner repents and believes. And then the new birth happens. That transformation occurs. God places his Holy Spirit in the life of the unbeliever. They are born afresh and anew, born again. And the Bible says no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. The gift of the Holy Spirit then restores relationship between us and our creator God and it guarantees us an inheritance for all eternity. What an amazing gospel message we have to proclaim, isn't it? Extraordinary. So... That, in summary, is the gospel message in accordance with the scriptures. And that is what we are called as Christians to present to the world. Now, in, a, right, in accordance with the scriptures. Now, you'll notice that the first two building blocks of the gospel message are what we read about in the opening chapters of Genesis. So it's like these two blocks, the creation and the fall, the rebellion of man, are the foundations of the whole message that we have to bring. So if those things are not true, if evolution is true, then Genesis is not. And if Genesis is not true, then the gospel is actually without foundation. So it's kind of like it suspended out there. Jesus comes gives his life for us on the cross, is raised from the dead, and people believe in the Lord, they're born again, but there's no connection to the real world. Now, a lot of churches in our culture today preach that as the gospel, okay, without the first two building blocks. Now, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that people aren't born again and come out of the kingdom, they do. But when you don't have the foundations in there, there's a danger. And the danger is that people can drift away, firstly, because of nagging doubts. Is the Bible really true? I mean, it's got all this stuff at the beginning which science tells us is wrong. Maybe other bits are wrong. And if you're like me, as I grew up, I didn't understand my faith and I couldn't defend it. I therefore didn't share it because I didn't have any confidence. So what I did was what a lot of people have done, and that is I replaced this bottom foundation stone with the idea that God used evolution as the mechanism for creation. It's called theistic evolution. 
But that means a number of things. It firstly means if God used suffering and death to create over millions of years, then the creation was not very good. Okay, you look at a world, a, a little creature struggling for survival, dying in agony, um, millions of years of all this going on before mankind even appears. How can God look at that and declare it to be, oh, this is great, I love the way those animals are dying. I mean, that's bizarre. That's not God's character at all, is it? So, right away, we have a conflict with what the Bible plainly says. And what about the rebellion of man? It had no physical consequence. Death was already in the world. So Adam's sin really didn't mean anything much at all. So what we have is, if you like, a fall-less gospel. Now, the denomination in which I grew up really had that kind of an approach to the gospel. We rarely ever heard any teaching about the fall of man and the consequence of sin and so on. It was simply believe in Jesus. And what does it mean for Jesus' sacrifice? Why did he go to the cross? Death and suffering cannot be the result of sin. So what was the point of the Son of God dying for us on the cross? When I was in my teens, I used to wonder, why did Jesus have to die? I went to the leadership of my church and uh, asked that question. I used to reason like this. Why couldn't God have uh, sent his Son into the world, shown us how to relate to our Creator, Father in heaven, and then been transfigured up into heaven? Why the agony of the cross? And unfortunately, the leadership in my church couldn't answer my question. I got answers like, oh, well, through the cross, Jesus identifies with us in our suffering. I thought, really? That's a bit weak. I mean, you can identify with people without having to do something like that to your son. Um, and someone else said to me, Jesus came up against institutionalised sin. Yes, but then think of people who have stood against social evils like, like prostitution and slavery. They've lost their lives, but their deaths did not pay the price for all of mankind's sin. There's still a piece missing here. And I could not understand my faith. And others say, well, maybe, maybe the fall, maybe the, the death that came into the world was spiritual death. Maybe it wasn't actually physical death at all. Um, Adam and Eve just died spiritually. Well, imagine if that was the case. So here's Adam hiding himself in the garden and God comes and says, you know, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. That's part of the curse. So why would he say that to Adam if Adam was already going to die? He would have just said, so what? I'm going to die anyway. See, it makes no sense of that, does it? But if Adam would have lived eternally had he not sinned, then this now has significance and meaning. And then others say, well, maybe animals all died, uh, but it was just human beings that now experienced death. So was there animal death before sin? Well, there's no single scripture that says there was no animal death before sin. But there's a whole bunch of scriptures that all point that way. For instance, animals and man were all vegetarian. Remember right back in Genesis 1, God gave all the green plants and so on for the animals and man to eat. Permission to eat meat was only given to Noah after the flood. God declared the creation to be very good. There was no bloodshed and suffering going on. God provided animal skins for Adam and Eve, the first animal death recorded in the Bible as a covering for sin. God cursed the serpent above all animals. They were not already cursed, but then they were. Death relates to the nefesh haya in the Hebrew, which means the breath of life. So it doesn't include, say, insects, for instance. And the life is in the blood, the Bible tells us. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And in Romans, we read that the whole of creation is in bondage to decay. It's all now running down as a result of Adam's sin. And finally, death is the last enemy, we read in Corinthians, to be put under Jesus' feet. So all of those scriptures all point to the reality of a creation without animal death. But just imagine 
what it would have been like if there had been animal death all around Adam and Eve. You might have a situation like this. If the theistic evolution is true, all this brutality and bloodshed going on, and, and there's Adam, and God says to him, Now, Adam, nature is bad for you, but if you obey me, I will save you from nature. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a hypothetical conversation which, of course, never happened. But can you see how absurd a notion it is to believe that there was animal death but not human death? It makes no sense of a very good creation. So when God declares everything was very good, if theistic evolution was true, underneath Adam and Eve's feet, there would have been layers and layers of rock full of fossils showing death, disease and suffering over millions of years. And yet God declares it to be very good. You see, it makes no sense of the scriptural record at all. Now those as Paul, John, wrote scripture without error. Rather, we are wise to assume that the biblical authors expressed themselves as human beings writing from the perspectives of their own finite, broken horizons. Now, if you think about that, <laughs> what he's just said is that the biblical authors were mistaken. They don't have the benefit of modern science, you see. They don't know what we know. And uh, so they've all got it wrong. But Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father say, I only do what I see my father do. So if we, if we accuse Jesus of error, we are also accusing God of error. And by the way, the Holy Spirit then inspired the human authors to write what they wrote, so the Holy Spirit must also have inspired error. And uh, so you've actually impugned the character of all three persons of the Godhead. So trying to mix atheism into the Bible is not a good thing to do. It leads you ultimately strictly into apostasy, which is what that is. So theistic evolution, I think, is totally contrary to what the Bible plainly says. But there are a few others that have been around. The gap theory came up in the early 1800s in a genuine attempt to try and fit the two accounts together at that stage. Um, geologists were starting to talk about the vast age of the Earth. Uh, Darwin published his book in the middle 1800s. So the idea of the gap theory, and by the way, in the answer's book, there's a whole chapter on this explaining it. The idea is that between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2, there's a gap. And in that gap is where you stick all the millions and billions of years of creation. Now, this idea uh, has been taught in Bible colleges for many, many years. And lots of pastors trained through Bible colleges have thought, oh, well, that solves that problem, and moved on without really understanding the implications. But the problem is the Hebrew grammar does not allow for a gap. And the reason is this, there is actually no grammatical gap between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2. Genesis 1.2 begins with what's called a verb disjunctive. It's like a parenthesis, if you will. Um, it's translated as now, which is correct in the NIV, but not in the King James, which translates the first word as and. So what it is doing is describing the condition of things at this particular time. Genesis 1.3 begins with the consecutive, which implies a sequence, an unbroken sequence of events, translated as and, um, and the King James each day begins with and God said, meaning that there's a, a continual flow of thought throughout. Then others have thought, well, maybe um, this formless and void thing um, doesn't mean that it's in process, this is partly formed and not yet completed, but um, maybe it means that the earth became formless and void. But that same construction occurs many times in the Old Testament is never translated as became. A good example um, is uh, in Genesis 13 when Abraham leaves Egypt and it says, Abraham was very rich. So that's the same grammatical construction as this one here. Um, so you would have to read it then that Abraham became very rich when he left Egypt, but that's not the context or the case at all. 
The other claim comes out of Jeremiah, where they believe the words tohu and bohu, meaning formless and void, uh, mean a judgment, but they can equally mean as yet unfilled. So a good analogy, I could have a Word document on my computer, which is empty because I haven't yet started to type in it. So it just means waiting to be filled. Or I could have a document here which I then delete. Now it means empty because I've destroyed the contents. But in Jeremiah, it's referring to a judgment. But in Genesis, it's referring to the fact that it's a blank canvas, if you like, at this point, waiting to be filled. So the gap theory fails on, uh, on grammatical grounds and uh, others I'll share in a moment. The day age theory, you might have heard of that one, uh, comes from, um, also from chapter two you'll find in the answers book, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. So people often say, oh, well maybe the days of the creation week were in fact vast periods of time. But the context of this is of course in relation to the second coming of Jesus. So, and, and what Peter is saying is that God is not slow, as some people think of slowness. He's outside of time. With him, a day can be like a thousand years, or a thousand years can be like a day. So one way is sort of expanding time, the other is contracting it. So what people do is they take the first bit and they say, well, maybe the days of creation in Genesis are thousands of years. But why not take the other bit? Why not say, well, the thousands of years are like a day? And if that was true, then the six days of creation would contract down to about a quarter of a second. So that doesn't really help the cause at all. But the point is, the context always gives the clear meaning of what day is. So there are several meanings for the word day, aren't there? And I could construct this simple sentence here, in my father's day, now that means an indefinite period of time in the past. doesn't mean that my father only lived for one day, because if he did, I wouldn't be here, right? It took 10 days. You know, if you put a number next to the word day, it always means a 24-hour day. And you can test it in any language you like. Always means the same. So if uh, I said to you, I'm going to uh, return in two days' time, you look at the calendar and discover that Today is, uh, what is today? Is it the 29th today? So if it's the 29th, you say, oh, well, Mark's coming back on the 31st. How did you get that? It added two to the calendar date, right? It presupposes a 24-hour day. And to drive across the outback during the day, meaning the daylight hours of day. So there are multiple meanings for the word day, but the context always makes it clear. And a good example of that is in Numbers chapter 7, there's an account of the leaders of the 12 tribes bringing their gifts to Moses for the tabernacle. And we read on the first day, on the second day, on the third day, all the way to the 12th day. Now, no one ever suggests that it took 12,000 years for the Israelites to bring all the offerings to Moses. Obviously, that's ridiculous. But it's the same grammatical construction as what we find in Genesis chapter 1. It's interesting that uh, this word... Yom, for day, in Hebrew, appears thousands of times, about two, over 2,000 times, I think, in the Old Testament. And the only place it's questioned, interestingly, is Genesis chapter 1. So it means a new 24-hour day in each case in number 7. Uh, same grammatical construction as I mentioned. No one doubts the meaning in number 7, so why do people question it? in Genesis 1. Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? Because that's the point where it conflicts with what our culture teaches. And of course, I shared this scripture before. In the Ten Commandments, God said, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. And that's a command to keep the seventh day as a special day of rest. Now, that would have no meaning if that was meant to say, for in 6,000 days you were to work and then rest for 1,000 days or years or whatever. You know. uh, it must mean just a simple day. Let's have a quick look at this one. The framework hypothesis is a, one of these more academic things um, taught in Bible colleges. It got, uh, because it's 
it's kind of uh, morally complicated and academic. People like it, you know. And they think, oh, this is wonderful, and they dig into it. I think it feeds um, our human pride a bit. The idea is that Genesis provides a framework for understanding the greater narrative of the Bible, but it's not a literal account of what actually happened. So it seeks to maintain biblical authority whilst rejecting the six days of the creation week. And uh, the first thing it challenges is the literary genre of Genesis 1. It says, now, it's not history. This is all just poetry, you know. It's a, a description, a poetic expression of what God did at the beginning. But there's a rather interesting statistical analysis <clears throat> of poetry and narrative that I think is very revealing. So the authors here looked at um, 49, sorry, 97 Hebrew texts. 48 of them were narrative, describing an account of something. 49 of them were poetry. And they looked at the use of past tense verbs and how that dis distribution worked. So that's what's up the axis on the left-hand side. Uh, pressure to find like verbs is, if you like, the number of, of past tense verbs. Now, when you're describing history, you say things like, we went from there to there, we had this, we did this. You're using past tense a lot. So history tends to be typified by past tense. And uh, these, this was a selection, as you can see, quite a large number. And they looked at the ratio. So the ratio of past tense to other tenses in narrative was over 50%. In poetry, it was about 4%. So when you analyse the opening chapter of Genesis, where does it fit on the chart? Well, it turns out, I've done that bit, sorry. It turns out that Genesis 1 through to third verse of chapter 2 is right up there very firmly in the narrative section. So if you're into statistics, that happens to be a... 99 with two nines percent probability that it's narrative, not poetry. So how do you determine if something is Hebrew poetry? Well, one of the giveaways is the structure of the words. There's a thing called a, a chiasmus or an X, and there's only one verse of poetry in Genesis chapter 1, and it's verse 27. So God created man in his image, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That's a verse of Hebrew poetry. And it's like God reaches the culmination of his creative effort making man in his image and he breaks into poetry to describe that moment. And you can see that characteristic X structure. But that's the only verse. The rest of Genesis chapter 1 is prose. Very structured and magnificent prose, yes, but prose nonetheless. The second point they make, they make a number, but this is the other key thing, is that Genesis is really a polemic against the surrounding cultures. Uh, for instance, the Babylonian myth of uh, the Gilgamesh epic, and uh, they believe Genesis was an attempt to try and refute those. But I would suggest that if you're trying to, to refute a myth, you don't use another myth, you refute it with actual facts. It's the only way you can do the refutation. So in the Gilgamesh epic, this is a, uh, an account of the flood. It's um, a Babylonian guy called um, Utnapishtim who um, has this great flood and uh, he gets all his animals onto it, but he survives in a cubic arc. It's the dimensions are given. Now think about it. If you're in a, a cubic box, equal length on each side, in a stormy sea, what's going to happen? You're just going to tumble and tumble. I would not want to be inside such a vessel. But it's not seaworthy, quite clearly. It's a myth mythological story. It's not a true story. The gods are terrified by the rising floodwaters and they're starving because the humans are not making offerings to them. So this is a polytheistic religion, which is a degeneration of monotheism. And the people groups all around the world, interestingly, have flood legends, which is entirely consistent with the Tower of Babel account. So remember, after the flood, the Tower of Babel occurs, and then the people all spread out away from that because of the confusion of languages. Now, Noah was still alive at the time of the Tower of Babel. So everybody who left the Tower of Babel knew the truth. 
Some of them would have taken a written record, some would have just made it a verbal account which they passed on. Remember the Chinese whispers game that Ian had us doing on the first night? That's the kind of stuff that happens and it gets, you know, more embellished and more inaccurate as time goes on. Interestingly, even Australian Aboriginal people have flood legends. Jenny and I had the privilege of going into Arnhem Land some years ago now, and on the way in, you drive past, uh, this is going into Gumbalanya, or uh, Owen Pelly, as it used to be called. Uh, you go past this, this ridge, and on the top of the ridge is a, a thing that Europeans call the piano lid. And it's this rock there sitting up there at an angle. But it turns out, the story the Aboriginal people have is that this is the remains of the paper bark raft that saved the surviving family from the great flood that destroyed the whole earth. That's in the Aboriginal cultures. And there are many other stories of floods in different uh, people groups in the Aboriginal <coughs> tribes around the country. So we make legends out of history, but we don't make history from legends. So the Gilgamesh epic is actually just a corruption of the true history of Genesis. It's not the other way around. So Genesis is not a polemic against this. It came first, that was the truth, and this has become a corrupted version. So the framework hypothesis actually doesn't stand up to scrutiny. You'll find a lot more detail on each of these if you're interested in them on our website and in part in the answers book. And then there's this one, Progressive Creation. It's been put forward by a guy called Hugh Ross. And uh, his line of argument is that um, he wants to accommodate the billions of years uh, into the biblical text. So he says that the days of creation are vast ages. And by the way, the seventh day, he says, is still continuing because on the seventh day, there was no record of a morning and then an evening. Uh, he says animal death and, uh, and carnivory preceded man, that Adam was some sort of a hominid in a herd of hominids wandering around the African savannas and God placed his spirit into Adam and Eve. Um, God created the various creatures in separate acts over vast periods of time, hence the name progressive creation. And he believes that Noah's flood was local. <clears throat> so it's, it's an interesting thing and he's actually built a whole ministry called Reasons to Believe and uh, speaks in Bible colleges around the world, major churches and so on, written a whole number of, a uh, bunch of books, a very famous bloke. But has the seventh day ended? Well, the argument is the absence of evening and morning means it hasn't ended and in Hebrews 4 it means that God is still resting so the seventh day is still continuing, that's how he uh, reasons. But God's present rest does not logically imply a long seventh day. It simply means that the believer's rest is an eternal one in God. God's rest on the seventh day is always spoken of in past tense. And when you look at what it says in Genesis, it says, and God rested, past tense, from all his work of creation. Not that he is still resting in a present tense. And I've mentioned Exodus 20, the fourth commandment, um, where the Sabbath commandment only makes sense if all the days are normal earth rotation days. So was Noah's flood a local event or was it global? Well, all the evidence in geology would tell us it was a global event, but the scriptures themselves say the waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. So how could you cover all of the high mountains under the entire heavens with a local flood? Unless, of course, it was something like this, but of course, that's bizarre, right? <laughs> it clearly can't be. So the language that we read in Genesis is clearly a global flood. So then people often say, well, where did all the water go? If the water covered the earth, where is it now? Good question. With the aid of Google Earth, we can zoom back out above the Pacific Ocean. You can see a little bit of Australia and New Zealand there. On the other corner, you can see a little bit of the west coast of the US. There's a lot of water out there. Do you know that if you could raise the ocean basins 
and lower the continents so that the earth was a perfect sphere, like a billiard ball, then the water of the oceans would cover the earth to a depth of nearly 3,000 metres. That is a lot of water. So there's lots of places where it could have gone. And then someone says, hey, but hang on, Mount Everest is higher than that. And that's true. But remember at the subsidence of the flood, the mountains rose up and the valleys sank down. Everest did not exist before the flood. It re exists as a result of the flood. And there are marine fossils, as I mentioned before, in the Himalayas, indicating that all of that rock was once uh, under the sea. Okay, so the last one that I want to touch on is a very prevalent one. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but it's, I suppose in the last decade, it's really started to impact Bible colleges uh, around the, the world, in fact. And uh, it's a guy called John Walton who's written a series of books, the Lost World series. First one was published in 2009 and the last one just a few years ago. And uh, John Walton is uh, an ancient Near East literature expert. And basically his um, argument is this, the traditional understanding of the Bible is mistaken. We need to understand ancient Near East literature to be able to interpret the Bible. And only now can we really understand Genesis. Now, I, I have to say that that does smack of a certain academic arrogance, I think. Um, basically, what he's saying is that God has obscured the meaning of Genesis from the Jewish people all the way through right up to the time of Jesus and from the church for the next 2,000 years to the present day. No one's been able to understand Genesis until John Walton has arrived with the key. And uh, it's his learning in ancient Near East literature. So I've got material on each of the books that he does and I don't propose going through all of that. But it's interesting that in 2 Peter 3 and 5 it says this, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. So that's a direct reference back to Genesis, isn't it? The Genesis creation and then the global flood. So we live in times when people are going to deliberately reject those things. And uh, the authors of The Lost World of the Flood play fast and loose with biblical authority and inerrancy. And I think this is a conclusion we can safely reach as the author of this article did. The end result of Walton's teaching is to place in the mouth of Christ and the word of his heavenly Father falsehood and error. This is tantamount to blasphemy and should be rejected by discerning readers. Walton's Lost World series should therefore be exposed as the dangerous works of false teaching that they are. The sad thing is, though, that, as I said earlier, Bible colleges all around this country teach one or other or several of these options, these ways of trying to integrate the atheistic worldview of our culture into the Bible. And it comes at a great cost. The cost is, and you might have heard of... Um, just anecdotal evidence of people with great uh, enthusiasm and good intentions going to Bible college and basically losing their faith as they go through the course and emerging out the end uh, just walking away from the Christian faith. Our second son went along to a Bible college in Sydney, actually it's a national one, and he was amazed that most of the teaching he received was about why you should not believe what the Bible says. It's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And it's a crisis, I believe, for the church, a crisis that we need to be confronting and Bible colleges need to be brought back to what their mandate is, that is, to teach the Word of God. But firstly, to teach that it is authoritative and authentic and it's the truth. And when you start with that, everything makes sense. 
Or as I said at the beginning, understanding Genesis changes everything. It changes how we see ourselves, how we see the world, our understanding of the gospel message. You see, the problem is every single one of those schemes places death before Adam. You think about it, that gets us off the hook, doesn't it? It wasn't our fault. All this mess that the world is in is not our fault. It must be God's fault. God, fix it. But who broke it? We did. It was our rebellion against God that has led to the consequences. But God has actually fixed it in a very real sense. But let me just share, and I'll just close off on that in a minute. But because they all placed death before Adam's sin, and because they are seeking to integrate evolution, what this guy has to say is very true. Now, William Provine is an atheist, or was. He's dead now. I think he's a creationist now, actually. Anyway, so that was a bad joke, wasn't it? But he said this, belief in modern evolution makes atheists of people. Now, think about that. Christians who believe in evolution are heading on a path that if you go all the way and follow it logically, you basically end up rejecting the faith. Because how do you know there's a God? The universe made itself, and if there is a God, he's really irrelevant because he has no bearing on what's going on. So it pushes God right out of the picture. One can have a religious view that is compatible with evolution only if the religious view is indistinguishable from atheism. And so much of the church today is all about, you know, we need to be kind to people and loving and uh, all this kind of stuff, which is all true, of course. But when you take away the fundamentals, which is Jesus has paid the price for our sin and it's by faith we can be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and we can outwork the calling he's placed on our lives in the world. But when we just try and live nice lives as good people, it's indistinguishable from atheism. You know, Paul was really uncompromising on this point. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned, he says in, in Galatians. Wow, that's, that's really strong. You think about it. Let him be eternally condemned. That's how serious Paul sees the taking um, or, or compromising the gospel message. And then in the very, very next verse, he goes on and says, as we've already said, so I now say again, if anybody's preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. So it's one after the other. So God's word is our source of truth. But a lack of belief obscures it, makes it all sort of fuzzy. We can't get a clear understanding like I had as a young man, unable to even explain or grasp why did Jesus die for me? The central, central point of the gospel message. It makes no sense. You know, the disciples asked Jesus, what must we do to do the work that God requires? And Jesus replies, very interesting, this is the work of God, that you believe in whom he has sent so we should be believing Jesus, what Jesus said. But remember, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. What did Jesus say at the beginning? In the beginning, God created. So if we don't believe that bit, we're now not believing. We're not doing the work of God. We are adding unbelief into our faith. So it's my hope that as a result of this weekend that we will all be like those noble Bereans. Remember when Paul was preaching to the Bereans? He said, uh, or it's recorded, Luke records it in the book of Acts, he said the Bereans were more noble than other Jews. You see, why was that? I would like to think that everyone would be able to say this of Legacy Church. Now the Legacy Church members were of noble character. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Mark said was true. Now, I wouldn't expect you to believe anything that I tell you just because I told it to you. 
But I would expect you to believe it if you find what I say to be consistent with God's word. So let me leave you with that and um, just the ongoing encouragement to get equipped. How to get equipped? One of the best ways is through Creation Magazine. And uh, if you haven't had a look at one of these, please do so. This is a great witnessing tool, actually, as I've already shared. Um, it's written for lay people, short articles that are fascinating things about nature, about the world around us, that all point to the Creator God. There's a children's section in it as well. Let me just find that bit if I can. Um, that's probably the one. No. Well, there's one in there somewhere. Just can't find it. Ah, oh, there it is. So, why are there thorns and prickles? That's a good question. Did God create all these nasty things? And if so, why did he do it? Well, there's a great little kid section on that topic in there. Fantastic resource. You can subscribe over there. Jenny's got uh, a form for you to fill out. These are various little leaflets, all of which are free. There's several of them over there. We talked last night, remember, about evolution and natural selection. This one says, can you tell the difference between evolution and natural selection? That's a freebie. Make sure you take one with you because there's a profound difference between those. And this is a great little leaflet, 15 questions for evolutionists. Now, if you know someone who's absolutely committed to the evolutionary story, just take one of these questions, or give them the leaflet if you like, they'll probably throw it away, but just ask them one of the questions of the 15. So if evolution is true, how do you account for and give the question? See, that's a great way of getting people to think about what they believe and why they believe it. And then you can provide an answer because in each of these little sections, they're very short, but there's a link to an article on our website which would give them some food for thought and hopefully confront them about the truth of what God's word says. Well, thank you very much for your attention. That's all I've got for that session. We're Ten minutes ahead of morning tea. So if anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Yes? You mentioned about all the other theories that yeah. are being taught in Bible college. Yeah. Um, is creationism not... Yes, yeah, it, it is taught in some, but remarkably not many. There are a few uh, Bible colleges that I've had the privilege of being invited to speak at that are strong advocates for the authority of the Word of God. Um, but unfortunately, the major ones, like the really big ones, often receive a lot of their funding from associated universities uh, or from, from government. And the problem with that is that when you're financially dependent upon another organisation that is a state-based one or a secular one, they're going to influence what you can teach. And that's the catch. And it's very, very hard for those major Bible colleges to actually make an unequivocal stand on the authority of the Word of God. Um, the same actually applies to Christian schools. Christian schools receive government funding. Uh, Jenny and I were in the UK a few years ago, and at that time, the, um, what do they call them, the Secretary of State, which is the equivalent of our Federal Minister for Education, issued a policy statement on the funding for faith-based schools. And the policy said you can continue to receive funding so long as you teach history and science in accordance with the accepted views um, of the society, or words to that effect, they weren't the precise words. So basically, and, and uh, also that um, in something like, uh, like religion, you could teach creation in the religion course, but they went on and said, so long as it is not presented as evidence-based. Right? So you can tell your students that, oh, look, there was this rainbow serpent and uh, whatever happened and uh, God spoke the world into existence in six days and this group believes that the earth rests on the back of a huge turtle or something, you know. You can teach all these things, class them all as myths, but don't ever suggest that they might actually be true with evidential support because if you do, you lose your funding. Mm. Now you think about that, that's, that's control over what the schools can teach. Now that's happening here. 
in this state. Sorry? Yeah. Right. But even in. I don't know about the evidence based stuff for it, but. Well, that was happening in the UK in 2012 when we were there. I believe it really has happened yeah. here already. Yeah. So it's pretty scary stuff, isn't it? So even in a Christian school that's receiving government funding, they're not free. Well, someone once asked me, would you like creation to be taught in science classes? Well, absolutely not. Because creation is not science, but neither is evolution. Creation and evolution are religious beliefs about the past. They're philosophies about the past. Science should be teaching science. We should teach kids to make observations and how to teach them how to make logical deductions from what they've observed. You know, how to apply the principles. But don't tell them, oh, millions of years ago, dinosaurs evolved into birds or something. That's not science. That's an expression of belief. It's not observed and it can't be demonstrated. So science should be for science. It shouldn't teach religion. And in the religion class, that's fine. You can teach what the Bible says and you can show that the evidence supports it. But other beliefs are not rooted in direct science? Sorry, other? But the beliefs of evolution are not there. They're rooted in science and observable science that we can see today. No, they're not. Yes, they are. That's the problem, you see, because what it is, it's a worldview that you start by assuming there's is no creation God. Is not a worldview too, then? Of course, that's what I've been saying all along. Mm. Right? But it's a worldview based on God's word. So the other one. Hang on, hang on. If we're not allowed to present evolution as fact, then why would we be able to present creation as fact? We're presenting the word of God as fact. And what the Bible tells us, the history that the Bible gives us, we see consistency with that in the world around us. The evolutionary story doesn't have consistency with the world around us. The evolutionary story says you have to go from simple things to complex by natural processes, but there's no evidence for that. No evidence anywhere, no science experiment, nothing. It's interpretation of the data. And that's what you're being taught through the education system, which is why you believe it. But what I'm saying to you is you need to realise that this is the source of truth, not what people think. Because the problem is people don't want there to be a God, so they'll begin by assuming, let's assume there isn't one, and can we explain the universe without God? And so they try, but you actually can't. So this little leaflet, you might want to take one of those and have there are 15 questions in there that evolution that can't be answered from an evolutionary point of view but can be answered from a biblical point of view. Can you see how important this is? You see, if you end up with our young people so indoctrinated, which is what's happening, that's what we're doing. And remember I said on that first meeting, on, what's today, so Friday morning, I talked about the history of the world. What was the number one thing that stopped young people coming to faith? Remember it? Remember all those issues? And globally, there's this peak what was the number one issue? Can't remember? I'll bring it up again because we really need to get a hold of this. Wasn't it unanswered questions and unlikely? Uh, well, that was part of it, but more important than that, more specifically, let me just find it, here it is. Okay, this is the survey done with millennials, remember? 18 to 25 year olds. What makes you doubt things of a spiritual dimension, which of course limits their ability then to receive the gospel. And all of these options were provided, hypocrisy, religious people, science, human suffering, conflict, history, etc. The three curves represent the data from Australia, the data from New Zealand, and the data globally. Australia and New Zealand, the number one there, this comes up, ah, dear idea. Oh it's gone into a weird mode, I don't really quite understand why it's done that, just wait for a moment while I sort that out. I'll try again. 
it's really worth getting a hold of this reality because it is so important. Yeah, look, it's not... Uh, anyway, you, you'll have to see it's not, for some reason, it's going to a wrong mode. But you can see science is the number one issue in Australia and New Zealand, and just second globally. The number one issue globally is the hypocrisy of religious people. Now, remember, this survey was done in the late 19, and uh, so you're looking at the scandals in the church about child abuse would have pushed that particular parameter up. But the other ones are important too. Human suffering. Where does human suffering come from? Humans. Sorry? From people. Yeah, but what's its origin? Adam sinning. It's sin. Where did that come from? Adam. What is Romans 5 verse 12? Have you got Bibles with you? If you've got a Bible, look up Romans 5 12 and someone can read it for me. What about conflict in the world? Where does that come from? Sin again. Where does sin come from? History. Look at them all. The top group, all of them, relate back to the opening chapters of Genesis. And that's what it's about. That's what prevents young people from coming to faith because their minds are so influenced by the secular agenda. It's all they hear and it's presented as proof. What I'm trying to get you to see is that it's not science. Evolution is not science. Neither is creation. I've never claimed it is, right? So that's what I'm trying to say. In science classes, I would love to see science taught, not religion, whatever that religion is. Whether it's atheism, i.e. evolution. Whether it's Christianity, i.e. creation. Whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever you want. Don't teach it in science. Teach people to observe and deduct. Just hang on a second. Have you got Romans 5 to Yeah. yeah. No. I'll go for Michael. You go. All right. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sin. Right. So, how did death come into... Uh, wait a minute. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through who? One man. With who was? Adam. Adam. And what came next? Death through so where did death come from? Sin. From sin, which came from Adam. Right? And in this way, death comes to all men because all sin. So if Adam had not sinned, we would not have death in the world. God created a perfect world, which he declared to be very good. So in 1 Corinthians 15, around verses 20 to 22, it says, Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, the second man, of course, being Jesus. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So the first Adam comes and brings death and suffering. The last Adam pays the price so that we can all go free. That's the gospel message. And like we sang in that brilliant song during the worship time, it's by grace and grace alone. How awesome a God we serve. 